afternoon, everyone. We'll call the meeting to order. First item of business today is we'll open the hearing on Senate Bill 33. Advisor Wagner, a briefing, please. Yes, Mr. Chairman, Chris Wagner from the Revisor's Office. Uh, Senate Bill 33 would provide for a, a new display show license for vehicle dealers and manufacturers identified uh, or called the Temporary Display Show License. Uh, the bill would allow a sponsor to obtain from the Division of Vehicles um, a license to organize and operate a display show under conditions that the director may reasonably require. A fee of $100 would be imposed on the sponsor of the show, and each participant in the display show would be required to pay a fee of $35. And those fees will be remitted to the director of vehicles. Uh, eligible participants are allowed to participate in this display show uh, without regard to geographical territorial assignments or relevant market areas. Um, and the new motor vehicle dealers are not required to obtain approval um, nor can new motor vehicle dealers be treated adversely for participating in such display show. Uh, then finally, no sales or lease transactions may occur at the display show, but demonstration test drives are permitted. Uh, and as an additional note, the Senate Committee on Transportation uh, placed this bill on the consent calendar and it passed that chamber 39 to 0. I'd be happy to answer any questions the committee has. Are there any questions for the reviser? Mm -hmm. Seeing none, thank you. First proponent I have listed is uh, Mr. Don McNeely, Kansas KDA president. Welcome to the committee. Here to, uh, this afternoon, support a Senate Bill 33, which, as the reviser uh, detailed, it establishes a display show license, which will allow the display and demonstration of um, motor vehicles, uh, as well as uh, not only the dealers, but also the manufacturers, allowing them to display motor vehicles during an auto show. The proposed amendment will allow the Kansas City Auto Show, which has been held in downtown Kansas City since 1907, to be moved to Kansas, specifically the Kansas Speedway, in June of 2021. Uh, the, of course, the COVID pandemic has caused many changes in our society and the world not previously imagined, and our industry is looking for newly new and highly creative ways to do business. The move to the, uh, the auto show to the Kansas Speedway captures that creative spirit and it will provide the public with new mobility experiences and our industry's new and exciting products. It will also include a ride and drive uh, experience for those who attend the show. While many sh shows around the country are being canceled in 2021 due to the pandemic, the dealers in Kansas City are wanting to move forward and believe the Speedway offers an op uh, a ripe opportunity to do so. Uh, of note, uh, I think two or three weeks ago, the Detroit auto dealers, who normally have their world-class show at Cobo Hall in downtown Detroit, are moving that show to the Speedway in Pontiac, Michigan. Um, over, the, over this three-day show, there'll be a festival light atmosphere where, of course, the vehicles will take center stage but there'll be a lot of other things going on, food, fun, fireworks, music, and the re early reaction that the dealers have had to the show has been extremely positive. Of course, this move to the show from Missouri to Kansas will be beneficial to the state of Kansas, uh, Wyandotte County, as well as a localized legend Village West development area. I may uh, make mention that uh, the mayor of Kansas City, um, Quentin Lucas, took to Twitter last Friday and accused the state of Kansas of stealing this show, and nothing could be farther from the truth. The dealers had not been approached by the state of Kansas. They had not been approached by the unified government. This is merely due to the pandemic, and the, with the pandemic and the restrictions associated with that, it's, it would be very difficult to have an auto show inside at Barlow Hall where it has been previously held. 
On behalf of the Dealers Association, I'd like to thank you for allowing me to appear today, and I'd stand for any questions the committee may have. Mr. McNeely, would you state your, your uh, mic wasn't on when you first started. Would you just please restate your name? Oh, um, I'm Don McNeely. I serve as president of the Kansas Automobile Dealers Association. Perfect. Thank you. Uh -huh. Question, Representative Francis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Do you have any idea of what the uh, expected attendance is going to be for this event? The expected attendance? Uh, I, I can get that for you. I, I don't have it right off, in my notes right here. This sounds like a heck of an event. You know, I wish I could yeah. come to it. Yeah. It will be a good way to spend a weekend in the first week of June. Representative Helgerson. Well, let me, let me first say I think it's an exciting opportunity. Um, and in full disclosure, we set conventions and trade shows and auto shows. So yeah. I have a little bit of conflict, but also a little bit of knowledge. I haven't read the bill completely. I'm assuming this applies to all shows. Yes. Well, well, this is well motor vehicle shows. Yes. All motor vehicle shows. Right. So there are at least three in Wichita that come to mind right away that would classify. So all three would be of the same type. And some of the problems we had about antique tags would be covered in this. Well, no, this, this would be for new vehicle dealers and the, for the manufacturers. There, there's already uh, a general display license that dealers can get uh, outside of, of, of a show like this, Representative. Okay. Let me read it, and then I'll have some more questions. Okay. Are there further questions for Mr. McNeely? Representative Delbert Dang. Thank you, Chairman. Appreciate you being here. And mm -hmm. the previous rep kind of hit on what I was going to talk about, but you you obviously gave a good pitch on the Kansas City, Missouri versus Kansas, and getting that. And I'm I'm all for that. But I was curious how many other shows this may affect in the state of Kansas, because I know we have we do have smaller ones in the Wichita area, right? Um, no, I, not at all. I mean th that uh, statutory authority already exists on the books. This uh, prior to this legislation, the manufacturers could not participate in a show. Only licensed vehicle dealers could. Okay. And, you know, with a show of this magnitude, the manufacturers will bring in specialty products, uh, future concept type of products, those type of things for uh, display. I don't know if you've attended the show in the past at Barra Hall, but uh, a lot of the exhibits are actually manufacturer-owned exhibits as opposed to the dealer. Okay. I was kind of thinking of... I I think it's in maybe somebody from Wichita area can help me. I think it was called the Black Top. Black Top Nationals, yes. Yeah. Because I, I, you always see Ford right. representatives and stuff there too. That's why I was thinking it kind of plays right. into this. Yeah, we, we worked with the Division of Vehicles at that time. I believe the Motor Vehicle Director was Carmen Aldred. Uh, Mr. Chairman, you may remember, I, I know Representative Elgers, you probably remember to make accommodations for that show to uh, occur. Okay, thank you. Uh -huh. Are there further questions? Representative Helgerson. I apologize. I'm, anytime there's a manufacturer show or, or a show that has a manufacturer that doesn't have that has a car dealer, then the car dealer could get one of these tags. They get a general display show license. It'd be general similar to what they license. get when they when they display a vehicle at, at the mall or at the airport in Wichita. That would be the driving on the uh, normal driving, but it also in bill has that you can take test drives right yeah that, that and, and that's the caveat about having it outside that you can do the ride and drive experiences much more easily than you could you know they attempted in, in years past at Bartle hall they'd set them up outside of Bartle hall but you know here it'd be right there at the speedway okay so under this statute in this change mm -hmm. if there is a if Helgerson Motors is sponsoring a car at X show, I could get a display license, but I could also get one of these licenses well, or, or one of the display license and have uh, test drives outside of the facility and also have a promotion inside the show. Well, uh, again, this pertains to uh, licensed new vehicle dealers and the OEMs, the, uh, the original equipment manufacturers. 
There's currently a display show license on statutes that apply both for new and used vehicle dealers, which I believe would accommodate what you what you have described. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Representative Ballard. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, I'm looking at here that says no sales or lease transactions may occur right. at display. Um, what happens if, say, I'm looking at this car and mm -hmm. I really fall in love with it, my husband says, yeah, you can have it. Mm -hmm. All right. <laughs> All right. right. Along those lines. Right. Okay. Um, and they may be limited in cars. But they can't sell it to me. Not, but not, not at the show. Not at the show. No, but please. is there something they can do to say, see me tomorrow at 9 a.m.? Or, or how do you? The well, reason why I ask that, because I think people get around it. Well, I mean, I'm not saying that someone can, because you, you, you'll, you, you'll know your local dealer. I mean, right, I, right. I know you're, you're from Lawrence, and you could go see, you know, Laird Noller, Dale Willey, Crown Automotive, et cetera. Gotcha. But, so you can do that. Okay. Right. Now, this is something I do not know. What is a first stage manufacturer? That's before General Motors, Toyota Motor Company, second stage manufacturers are those manufacturers who would take that product that was manufactured by, say, General Motors, and then add some additional bells and whistles to it. Remember the, uh, the conversion vans? You know, 20 years ago, those were second stage manufacturers. Okay. Thank you. you know, that would put the seats in them, you know, the TVs. And then, of course, then the manufacturers started, you know, doing, adding those gotcha. uh, accessories. Thank you very much. Uh -huh. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Representative Dale Perdang. Thank you. This is the second time around. I don't like doing that. So I'm just trying to get it cleared up. And we're all familiar with the dealer tag. So is this similar, but it's a manufacturer's tag? Or? No, this has nothing to do with tags. This is merely a license that is issued to the division of vehicles, to the show sponsor, to in order to conduct this uh, an auto show. Gotcha. Right. And then each individual dealer or manufacturer that comes in with that manif with that sponsor pays an additional licensing fee to the division of vehicles. Further questions? Seeing none, thank you very much. Thank you. I would bring the uh, committee's attention to we have written testimony and support by Larry Carl, of, uh, CEO of uh, ADAGKA. And I'm not sure what that stands for. But, uh, oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you. I, I show no other proponents. Does anyone wish to speak as a proponent? I have no one listed as an opponent or neutral. Does anyone wish to speak on either of those? Seeing none, we'll close the hearing on Senate Bill 33 and open the hearing on Senate Bill 36. Reviser Wagner. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chris Wagner from the Reviser's Office again. Uh, Senate Bill 36 would provide for uh, salvage vehicle pools to perform vehicle checks for vehicles on their premises. Um, and also the bill would also provide for salvage vehicle pools and salvage vehicle dealers to apply to the division of vehicles for ownership documents uh, for certain vehicles. Uh, so starting off in section one, this uh, section would allow qualified employees of salvage vehicle pools to perform checks prior to the issuance of a title on vehicles stored at the salvage vehicle pool's uh, license location. Uh, if such vehicles are designated to be a salvage vehicle, a non-repairable vehicle, or a non-highway vehicle. Uh, the superintendent of the highway patrol may revoke, spend, decline to renew, or decline to issue a certification to an employee of a salvage vehicle pool. Uh, additional requirements for the uh, salvage vehicle pools uh, are that the, they have to maintain a bond in the amount of $50,000, and uh, it's only available for salvage vehicle pools that sell at least 2,000 vehicles per year, as reported to the Department of Revenue. Um, those are the only pools that are eligible to, to uh, have employees perform the checks. Uh, so that would be Section 1. Section 2. 
goes on to allow salvage vehicle pools and salvage vehicle dealers the ability to apply for ownership documents with the division uh, for vehicles uh, without forwarding the cert certificate of title of such vehicle um, if the vehicle is subject to an insurance claim and has been left on the salvage vehicle pool or dealer's uh, property for more than 30 days. Uh, as part of the vehicle or as part of the application for the ownership documents, the salvage vehicle pool or dealer must have uh, submitted two written notices to the vehicle owner and any lien holder, uh, notifying them that the vehicle is present uh, on their property. And then uh, upon successful application, the division of vehicles uh, shall issue either a salvage title or a non-repairable vehicle title uh certificate sorry certificate free and clear of all lien security and interest and encumbrances uh, again as a note uh senate committee on transportation had some technical amendments i guess we're, we're supposed to be part of the original bill um and that passed that chamber 39 to 0. i'd be happy to answer any questions the committee has other questions for the revisor Say none, thank you. And my first uh, listed opponent is uh, John Peterson on behalf of the insurance uh, auto auctions. Uh, he will be on WebEx. Welcome thank, to the committee. Thank, thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I assume you can hear me. Yes, we can. Uh, John Peterson, I'm appearing as a proponent for Senate Bill 36 uh, on behalf of insurance auto auctions, insurance auto auctions operates two uh, salvage pool facilities in the state of Kansas, one in Kansas City and it, one in Wichita. And I'm joined on WebEx by Andrea Crustenberry, who is the manager of the Wichita facility in the event the committee has any questions about the operation of salvage pool facilities in general or insurance auto auctions. Senate Bill 36, the, uh, the second part that Chris talked about begins on page nine, and that that was uh, last year's House Bill 2501, which uh, your committee heard uh, and enter, introduced uh, at the request of insurance auto auctions, heard and passed, and it passed the House, and it went to the Senate, and it actually uh, the Senate added an additional provision that you're going to hear about in a little while, and sent it to the Senate floor where it, the time ran out before it could be considered. But 2501 is virtually identical to uh, what is in section nine, and it is designed to deal with a, a very narrow problem, but a real problem. And that is uh, vehicles that are brought to a salvage pool facility uh, or or a salvage yard, uh, it's now included, by an insurance company or at the behest of an insurance company, but then the insurance company denies the claim and the owner of record abandons the vehicle there. So it becomes abandoned both by the owner and by the insurance company because they have decided not to pay the claim. And it allows in that very narrow circumstance, if the vehicle has been abandoned for more than 30 days, that the, uh, in, uh, the salvage pool could begin the process of sending a, a, a notice to the owner and the lien holder by certified mail. And they have to send them two different notices and they have to get a receipt back from them. If they don't get a receipt back from them, then they have to actually publish it in a in a paper in the in the county and if all of those things occur then a salvage title could be issued and and the vehicle disposed of so it is a very narrowly drawn to deal with we have other statutes that deal with insurance companies and titles when they pay claims this is a very narrow situation where they uh, actually send the vehicle for auction, but then as they process it, they end up denying the claim. Uh, the uh, Senate committee uh, included in this bill, actually added to 2501, 
and then included in Senate Bill 36 are additional provisions allowing for the delegation of certain inspection functions. And Mr. Smoot and other conferees are gonna to speak to those particulars, but we support those provisions as well. Mr. Chairman, we'd be glad to answer any questions at the appropriate time. Thank you. Except questions now. Uh, are there questions for uh, Mr. Peterson? Represent Weigel. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good to see you. Nice um, to see you. you. You mentioned that there are two of these facilities, one in Wichita and one in Kansas City? That that are owned by my client, Insurance Auto Auctions. Okay. Um, you're, going to, you're going to hear from uh, the other major uh, a company that provides salvage pool facilities, uh, Copart, is going to testify in a short while, and they can tell you how many facilities they operate. Uh, but this this also uh, allows uh, salvage, the, the same provisions uh, based on the way the bill is, is written now, uh, also include salvage companies, of which there are uh, a number, would still be governed by the same provisions Actually, there are even tighter provisions about uh, uh, the, the vehicle being brought to them by the insurance company. Okay, so there, there, there's probably, I don't know, uh, maybe 10 or 20 of these, but only two of them are clients or are, are, are what you're describing. Yes. That they're, yes. in, in, they're I, by I, insurance companies. Correct. Is that is that what what you were saying? Uh, our our company is not owned by insurance companies. It provides primarily services for insurance companies, and its name is Insurance Auto Auctions. Okay. Well, and one one out last question. There's a facility out here just west of Topeka on I-70, about less than five miles. Once you get through the interchange out there on 470. Uh, is that an auto auction or is that uh, some kind of where they would bring uh, abandoned or wrecked vehicles? Or do you even know? I, I, I think it's called I-70 auto auction. Is, I have driven that, past it and I'm familiar with, but I, I do not know how it is licensed. You do have, have some good folks from uh, DMV or on uh, I, th I think the number of uh, uh, salvage pool facilities in the state of Kansas probably is closer to five or six uh, than the 10 to 20. There's, there are not that many, but I, I do not know how that facility is licensed. Uh, thank you for your comments. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Representative Proctor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. A uh, quick question. So sec in section two, uh, the the kind of the power that it would give you to um, you know go get these vehicles titled. Um, what would be the impact if we expanded the audience for that to other? Because I can think of a lot of situations where vehicles are abandoned on property for a long time, and the process is pretty Byzantine for other people to do this. But, but would there be a negative impact to to your operations, or is there any second or third order consequences here? I'm not thinking of. We drafted it narrowly because we wanted to have the uh, those who uh, provide the licenses for the state of Kansas and the Division of Motor Vehicles to uh, feel that this was a situation that could not be uh, abused or that they would have any concerns about. And so it it, it probably wouldn't bother us, but there, there, I'm sure there are, there, there may well be others that, that would have concerns about um, making it uh, broader in scope than it, than the way it's written. Any further questions? Seeing none. Thank you, Mr. Peterson. Thank you. Now we'll move on to Mr. Brad Smoot on behalf of Copart Inc. Welcome to the committee. 
Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Am I on live here? It's okay. It's great. Uh, thank you so much. I'm Brad Smoot. I'm local counsel for Copart. Uh, we're an international um, auto salvage uh, pool operating two facilities in Kansas like IAA. Uh, we uh, uh, have a facility in the Kansas City area and another one in the Wichita area. Uh, we initiated uh, legislation uh, on, on the subject concerning the VIN uh, vehicle identification number uh, process that's currently underway in order to help us uh, speed the process of getting those vehicles that end up on our lots uh, inspected. Uh, and then the issue is merged in this bill, as John has articulately uh, indicated. Uh, I might, if with the committee's permission, just elaborate just a touch on the history of this uh, process. Uh, we began uh, uh, visiting with the Highway Patrol about this in December of 2019, uh, met with officers in January, came up with our first draft proposal, which ended up be being Senate Bill uh, uh, 374. Uh, it was limited to salvage pools, uh, and uh, it was written in such a way that it's very similar to what we already allow uh, for new car dealers to do, to allow new car dealers to inspect uh, the, the VINs of, of vehicles. You can find that in Section 1F uh, of the bill. Uh, like as John indicated, we sought to make this as narrow as possible uh, for the benefit of the agencies that enforce uh, the do law enforcement. Uh, and so we have uh, given the highway patrol in the bill, as your staff has already mentioned, we've given them complete control over the process of which of the salvage pool employees will be allowed to do VIN inspections uh, and how they, their authority can be withdrawn, how they will be trained, give the, uh, the Highway Patrol complete authority uh, over the rules and regs process. This is just a, a dipping your toe into the privatization of some of this inspection process is, is the way that I would think about it. John has described the other, uh, the other part of the bill. One thing that you will want to note is the current fee that is now charged by the Highway Patrol for doing these inspections is $20 per hour. The bill calls for that fee to continue to go to the Highway Patrol, even though IIA and Copart uh, folks would be actually doing the inspection at our own expense with our own certified uh, employees. But we see no reason to disrupt the flow of money the Highway Patrol. They would still have responsibility for saying uh, who among our employees would be allowed uh, to do this. We don't envision more than a couple of employees uh, involved in that inspection process. With me today is uh, Peter Greenwood. Peter is the area manager for Copart, uh, supervises the two facilities here. He could talk to you about uh, the history of this. The gist of it is that we've had a backlog uh, here in the state of Kansas that, that we've had to deal with, uh, uh, certainly through no fault of the Highway Patrol. They do have some other things uh, that they can do and are well equipped to do and possibly should be doing in lieu of uh, this type of inspection. Uh, and so, uh, Mr. Chairman, that bill, Senate Bill 374, uh, passed the Senate 39 to nothing, was scheduled to be heard by this committee on the last day of the session last year when you were all interrupted by COVID. At the same time, as John has indicated, House Bill 2501, having passed this committee and then the Senate, the House floor, uh, 119 to three, uh, uh, headed to the Senate where it was approved, uh, slightly modified by the uh, Senate committee and was ready to be voted on on the Senate floor uh, that day when uh, COVID ended the session for you. And so we took the liberty of putting these two proposals together. Uh, Senator Peterson, the chairman of the Transportation Committee, had planned to merge the two bills on the Senate floor uh, that day that uh, the session ended. So we did that uh, in our original introduction of uh, Senate Bill 36. Um, we, we have worked hard with the DMV, as, as John Client has, to make it work uh, as well as, as it can. And we believe that the, with the help of the Senate committee, we have narrowed this bill as much as possible 
to not infringe upon or endanger the inspection process. Uh, we've made it limited only to uh, salvage pools uh, and the uh, salvage uh, equipment dealers uh, who could do the inspections. Uh, uh, they are the only ones that would be allowed on the statute to do so. I think actually it's only the salvage pools that can do the inspections. Uh, and the, um, uh, each of the salvage pools that do this are going to have to post a $50,000 bond uh, in, in order to perform these services. And they must be large enough to have 2,000 uh, uh, vehicles a year sold at their facilities. Again, the sole purpose of all those limitations suggested by the Senate committee was to narrow this process so that we dealt with the narrow problem of uh, these pools having so many vehicles that were awaiting inspection uh, at a particular time. Uh, with that, Mr. Chairman, I think I'd be happy to answer questions at your convenience. Uh, Peter, as I said, is here and knows many of the technical aspects and the history that we had with the vehicle inspection uh, piece. Does anyone have questions for Mr. Smoot? Representative Francis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And it may be a later conferee that would be better apt to answer these, but do you have a rough idea of how many salvage pools there are of this size in the state of Kansas? There are probably only two of this size, and you're yeah. hearing from um, both of them. There may be others. I'm just unaware of them. Any rough idea of the number of uh, titles that would be issued under the provisions of this? I mean, are we talking 100 or 10,000 or... Well, there are two different provisions, as, as you remember. Uh, one is the inspection uh, provision, and that only relates to salvage titles being issued. There is some confusion uh, about that. Uh, and then the other are the abandoned vehicles. Uh, but at one time, we had hundreds of vehicles that would need the inspection uh, done, and I assume that the, the other uh, salvage pool would had, had other numbers uh, that were notable. Uh, and Peter can certainly talk about that. Uh, as to the abandoned vehicles, I don't have that number, but that's a, that's a big number as well. Uh, so they are, they are both big numbers, and there is a large backlog of vehicles that need to be processed. Is there, that fair? There, ha there has been. I'll let Peter talk to that. But as you might expect, uh, just like your lives have slowed down and changed because of COVID, so has ours. And so um, uh, our, our needs are a little different today than they were before. But we are hopeful that they'll be back to the, to the volume that we used to see someday. Representative Del Perdain. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so uh, at a high level, the purpose of the bill really is to, I guess, streamline the operations that you yeah, get in the vehicle in, it's a man in there, et cetera. Do, so I, will I still wait? I, I would not have to wait the 30 day period. Is that true or not? You say the vehicle has to be abandoned. This is the, uh, the uh, IIA piece of the bill, the 2501 that you passed uh, last year. Um, you, it still has to be abandoned on your property for 30 days. Then you have to give the notices to the owner and the lien holder. And then if you don't reach them, you have to publish in the paper. So it, it will be at least 30 to 90 days at a minimum to, to get through that process just to apply for um, the, the uh, titles that DMV would issue uh, at your request. And then it, it, I think you mentioned it would be the salvage owners or the employees would be the, become eventually the certified inspectors. Right, and that deals with the other piece, the, what was 374 and now is, is section one uh, of this bill. Uh, it's a very limited number of people they would, they, all the information required by the Highway Patrol would be submitted. Highway Patrol would train these folks to do uh, the inspection as they do in some other states. Uh, and and uh, uh, if, if they weren't doing a good job or did something shady, they, they could be ousted by the Highway Patrol. So um, that's, the, that's the concept. Um, and, and hopefully it would allow the Highway Patrol to do other functions. And then, yeah. The end result would be you obtain a salvage title to the vehicle, correct? Correct. So I could still potentially sell that vehicle as long as I declare it was once a salvage title. I could sell it to somebody to drive or use or what have you then, right? It, 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 
could be, but it's not the washing or cleaning of titles that I think some people were concerned about because it is a salvage title that must be done first. It's just the inspection process. Yeah. Uh, that's where I was just a little concerned of where we don't have a, what I would call a neutral party doing the inspection, so. Right, and that's, that's the reason for, it's a great question, and that's the reason uh, why the Highway Patrol trains and certifies the people that would be doing this. Uh, uh, it's just, it's so much easier because we're on site uh, and can do this, and we're posting a $50,000 bond uh, to, uh, that, that was some of the concern that the Senate raised, and they wanted to make sure that we had, certainly had a vested interest in doing it right. Okay. Representative Francis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Do you know how many states allow a similar type of uh, processing of, of the uh, BIN? How many other states allow this process like this? Let me um, um, have Peter answer that question. My recollection is that I know of two close by, uh, New Mexico and Colorado have some version of this. We started patterning this after New Mexico, which is a lot broader, allows a lot more enter private entities to do the inspection than is called for here. We narrowed it down in, in hopes of, of getting the uh, uh, support of the Highway Patrol uh, with this and, and making everybody comfortable that it was going to be done right. Further questions? Seeing none, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to welcome, welcome uh, Mr. Peter Greenwood on behalf of Copart. Welcome to the committee. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Um, we've heard from Mr. Peterson and, and, and Brad on, on some of the broad strokes. So I wanted to get into to some of the volume uh, details. I'm, um, I'm Peter Greenwood. I'm the regional manager for Copart. Um, my region covers Kansas City and Wichita operations. Um, Copart represents insurance companies um, and other folks who, who want to process a, a car for sale through us, primarily salvage auto auction. Um, we process nearly 40,000 cars uh, a year in the state of Kansas within our two facilities. We employ between 40 and 50 uh, people within the state, as, many, as well as many downstream vendors such as uh, towing companies. Um, to look at the uh, abandonment piece uh, from a volume perspective, Representative Francis, you asked you know, how many we're looking at. Uh, right now in, in my Kansas facilities, I have between 12 and 1,800 of these vehicles that have been abandoned um, by the insurance carrier and, and the insurers. Um, some of the concerns uh, raised before um, it have been, you know, these vehicles go out on the road, et cetera. These are typically very, very low value cars. Uh, we're talking four, five, six, eight hundred cars. Thus, the reason why really nobody wants to have anything to do with them, the previous owner, the insurance company. However, we have put in capital to pick these vehicles up, store them in our facility, and then they essentially sit in our facilities with no way to liquidate them. Um, and this would su suffice that. And these vehicles would primarily go to the pick and pulls, um, recyclers, dismantlers, and and again, in, in, in the grand scheme of things, we'd probably never see the, the, the road again. So, um, And then on the inspection uh, piece, again, you know, my company, Copart, takes in 40000 I would have to assume uh, my competitor, which is the other major salvage pool, takes in roughly the same. Um, again, COVID has slowed it down a little bit, but at any point, we're looking in the state to 10 to 20 inspection needs per week. So call it four to 500 a year. Several years back, there was a, a backlog, again, in certainly no uh, fault of, of the Highway Patrol. Uh, you know, they have a, a larger scope than to worry about uh, VIN inspections. Um, while we do support um, their thoughts of, of protecting the citizens, um, I had testified uh, in, in a previous committee that I was the regional manager over New Mexico for, for a few years, and they have the, the, the similar ability to do VIN inspections. Uh, it is only certain employees that are allowed to do it, typically managers. It's not, you know, a new hire comes in. Here's your video. You can now inspect vehicles. You know, Copart is a global company, and obviously we, we have to protect ourselves as, as a large corporation and a publicly traded corporation. So, again, that is why we drafted the bill so narrow with a, with a large bond um, and some, over, some, some absolute oversight from the Kansas Highway Patrol. Um, 
I believe I've, I've covered uh, uh, everything. Oh, um, and one of the, when I, I just want to go back to the volume of um, abandonment vehicles. As you can imagine, if I have 1,800 of these in the state, I can park roughly 100 to 150 cars on an acre of land. Land costs us roughly $500,000 to purchase and to develop in, in the state of Kansas. Um, I've recently put 10 more acres down in Wichita. I have two sub facility in Kansas and now have just purchased another 80 acres in Kansas. Again, not all because of, of this, but it certainly is a significant impact if I'm carrying 1,800 to 2,000 of these cars uh, a year. Um, I'd be willing to take any questions. I appreciate uh, the ability to speak. Are there questions? Representative Minix. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, as this proposal, as you have said, would would uh, be complete in 30 to 90 days if if this were passed. Uh, your current situation, what is the time frame? Um, there, there really is no time frame because we do not have the ability to have a process in which to do it. So um, these vehicles, no matter um, you know, the insurance companies have abandoned them to us. The previous owner has no interest in these vehicles. So there really is no process. They essentially become paperweights, we, which we cannot dispose of. And, you know, uh, again, in previous testimony in another committee, um, we had some questions on timeline because we wanted to make sure that in case there was an owner that wanted their vehicle, you know, we would go through a rather lengthy timeline of notices, certified mail, public notices, um, one thing of, of, of note is most of these vehicles that are at my facility right now are hundreds and some are thousands of days old. So again, they represent such low value that people just aren't coming after them. And they've been sitting for, in, in some cases, years, just occupying a property with no, no ability to liquidate them. And, and again, we've, we've um, had capital costs to, to pick them up and store them. I'm saying Weigel. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, <clears throat> I want to just expand a little bit. So you're, you're working with the insurance companies, correct? Correct. And they, do they pay you a fee once that the, their insurance car comes to your facility? How do, how do, you, how do you get money to keep that kind of an operation going. That, that's what I want to know. I want to know how, how the money flows. So uh, both uh, Copart and IAA are, are major uh, customers, our insurance companies. These vehicles are involved in some sort of total loss or ca catastrophic uh, event. They come to us for processing. Uh, depending on the seller or typically insurance companies, we, are, we collect a fee from them to process the vehicles. However, once they abandon it to us, there's no storage. There's no. There's there's no uh, ability for me to go back to them. It's a. It's actually a service we provide. It's it's now it's, it's mine. <laughs> and and so at some point, you move those vehicles. Correct. I mean they don't sit there forever. Correct. Yes, they do. Oh, they do. Oh, yes. Yes, and, and again, in, in uh, a previous committee, uh, you know, I, I did have some information on on some of these vehicles and. 90% of them are over 180 days old. And most are into the, you know, two, three, four, 500. Some of them are 11, 1200 days old. There's just, there's, there's nowhere. I do not have a process in which to, to liquidate them. And this, but however, so, this bill would so suffice this, that. This bill would in effect help you to eliminate those. Absolutely. And again, these titles would have proper branding as they would have if we would have had uh, transferable documents. And again, as you, uh, you know, as you heard, you know, we're processing 40,000 cars a year, you know, 38,000 of them are going through properly with proper branded titles. All the title paperwork has to go to the state. The state has to approve all of the, all of the documentation to support the brand in which it uh, is given. And in this case, I, I would dare say 98% are over are gonna be a rebuild or a salvage title. And again, with the value of these vehicles, they, they will probably never see the road again. These are very, very old vehicles with, with uh, again, a, a value of four, five, six hundred dollars maximum. Okay. Can, I, can I ask what the fees that you charge? 
No, I couldn't. <laughs> I couldn't allow that. I have a competitor on the okay. line. <laughs> uh, that's that's why I was thinking. So, okay, that that explains that that's a little bit better. Thank you. Thank you for thank you, Mr. Chairman. Representative Ballard. <laughs> you're you're just trying to figure out how to get your husband to buy you a new car. I don't think these are the ones you want. Yes. To, to purchase the land and then to develop it because we have security fences and we, and we maintain it in a, in a certain manner with, with aggregate and rock and, and obviously within our corporate image. That is, that is rough uh, based on you know, similar uh, places we've, we've purchased in, in, uh, in Kansas. Correct. Uh, absolutely. Yes. Well, again, you know, in the Kansas market, we're processing, um, you know, 40,000 cars a year, roughly. The greater part of 38,000 of those are going through and we're getting the fees. And then when the vehicle sells, we get proceeds on, on those. So this represents a very small portion. Yes, it, it, it rep does represent a loss and it does represent us um, investing more capital in more land, which is, you know, and we buy large parcels of land. Again, I bought one in Kansas City, 75, 76 acres. So it's a significant investment. Um, and we prefer to cycle the cars through quicker so we don't have to just let them sit on the land without they're they're essentially uh, profit negative. Thank you, Representative Delper Dang. Thank you, Chairman. Can can you find, help me to f define abandon by the insurance company? In other words, who owns the vehicle at that point in time? <clears throat> uh, it depends uh, if there's any type of lien on it, um, but but typically. Um, Again, in these cases, it becomes abandoned uh, because nobody has any real vested interest in it. Um, the insurance company uh, has perhaps denied the claim. It's a, it's a, a low-value vehicle. Um, so, again, as a service, we accept the vehicle. Um, and then we try our hardest to try and get the, the, the proper documentation. And then we can't. So, essentially... Both the insurance company as a, as a service to them, we accept the vehicle, um, and on the in, the insured just never never comes after it. Um, and just you know, we we talked about the the VIN inspection being in New Mexico. Um, there are new bills in Connecticut, Massachusetts, uh, Montana. Uh, we're actually going to the governor's uh, uh, office right now for signature on that. I cover Montana as well. Um, and there are other states, Georgia, Nevada, Missouri, that are enacting the, the, the same laws on abandonment. So these aren't, these aren't wrecked vehicles that the insurance paid the owner off? Uh, the, the, on. These are vehicles that have been wrecked or involved in some sort of catastrophic loss sure. where um, the, uh, perhaps the, uh, uh, the claim has not been paid. Uh, sometimes these, these owners... Um, you know, just leave the vehicle. We can't get a hold of them. There's a myriad of, of, of reasons why we cannot get uh, process titles. Any further questions? Seeing none, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, committee. I show no other proponents. Does anyone wish to speak as a proponent? I have listed as opponents. Uh, first, uh, Captain Craig Phillips with the Kansas Highway Patrol. Welcome to the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and committee members. Um, my name is Craig Phillips. I am a captain with the Kansas Highway Patrol. Um, currently, I have the command over the Kansas Highway Patrol's Motor Vehicle Enforcement Unit. And within that unit, we are responsible for VIN inspections. Now, I've heard a couple times today um, that 
allowing. And our main concern, I should point out with this bill, is the VIN inspection side of it. So I've heard a couple times today that allowing salvage pools to conduct their own VIN inspections would free the highway patrol up to do other duties. I must say that this VIN inspection portion is my unit's duty. So this is what we do, and I think we do it uh, very well. So I appreciate, uh, on behalf of the Highway Patrol, the opportunity to voice some concerns and um, why we are opponents of this Senate Bill 36. Uh, the Kansas Highway Patrol has an extremely high degree of interest in protecting the integrity of the VIN inspection program. And Kansas should be very proud of our VIN inspection program, um, having spoken with uh, many of our counterparts across the United States. Uh, our inspection program is one of the most thorough um, that I have heard of, and we get complimented quite often about that. Um, our largest concern with this bill is allowing a, a non-law enforcement entity with a financial interest in the vehicle being inspected to perform a VIN inspection that will change the title status of this vehicle. Allowing this inspection process to take place outside of law enforcement control increases the potential for fraud. Some of these instances could include, and if you're familiar with uh, stolen vehicles um, and the VIN numbers that accompany any manufactured vehicle, VIN cloning, title washing, VIN switching, and intentional incorrect branding for monetary benefit. It should be noted that many vehicles that come into salvage pools do not qualify for inspection by any other entity than the Kansas Highway Patrol. Uh, the purpose of the Kansas Highway Patrol's Motor Vehicle Enforcement Program is to protect, to protect consumers, discourage auto theft, prevent the trafficking of stolen auto parts, ensure proper title branding, and ensure proper documentation of vehicle ownership. The Motor Vehicle Enforcement Program in Kansas protects citizens from unknowingly purchasing stolen vehicles or vehicles that were, de that were declared as salvage by state and insurance standards. We strive to ensure that a vehicle's title stays true so that it cannot be washed or altered to increase the value of the vehicle, which ultimately protects the consumer. Um, we at one point did meet with um, some members of a salvage pools to discuss their abandoned uh, vehicle issues and VIN inspections at the same time. The abandoned vehicle issue, um, the Kansas Highway Patrol has no say in that other than uh, we are partners with the Kansas Department of Revenue. That aspect um, falls within the Department of Revenue's purview. Um, as far as the VIN inspections go, we have, <clears throat> we go hand in hand um, when a vehicle comes into a salvage pool um, and it has an out-of-state title, it will require a, a, a VIN inspection. Um, once the owner documentations for that vehicle are procured, that's where we come in and do the VIN inspection. So during our meeting with some of the salvage pool representatives, um, we heard very large numbers of hundreds of vehicles that had been abandoned. And that may very well be true, but the VIN inspection part of that, um, we, we, the process we have in place takes care of those VIN inspections when they are requested to be taken care of. We even offered at one point to come in and do a mass um, inspection process for one of the salvage pools um, and take care of any vehicles that they felt were outstanding as far as the VIN inspections go. And that, ins that, that offer was, was never followed up on. Um, <clears throat> so with the numbers that we're talking about, um, as far as the VIN inspections go, we average um, in our Wichita office, in our Kansas City offices, we average about 10 to 18 inspections per week at the uh, salvage pool locations. 
And the process for that is they simply just call in and say, we've got X amount of cars. And we say, okay, we will be there typically within a day or two. Um, in Kansas City, we make it a point to stop by at least one of the salvage uh, pool locations on a, every Monday or Tuesday just to check in to see if they have anything for us to inspect. And oftentimes, the numbers that they ask us to inspect when we get there are often lower. So my point being here is that the abandoned portion of this bill with the large number of vehicles being abandoned and then the VIN inspection side of it, those two don't, don't match. If there are any outstanding VIN inspections, it's typically just because they haven't called them in yet for us to go to the location and inspect them. <clears throat> this is a pretty important aspect of the VIN inspection process as well. That VIN inspections require two points of identification. The two points accessible to non-law enforcement entities are the public VIN plate and the federal label. A large percentage of the vehicles that come into salvage pools have been damaged so extensively that these two points of identification are not accessible. Uh, locations of other points of identification on a vehicle are considered sensitive, and these numbers are referred to as confidential numbers. Uh, their locations are intended to be known by law enforcement and vehicle manufacturers. <clears throat> Oftentimes, salvage pools have power of attorney for insurance companies to determine what brand a vehicle should receive. Uh, the types of vehicles that come through salvage pools most often receive the following brands, salvage, uh, non-repairable, and on a few occasions, non-highway. When KHP inspects these vehicles, we assess the damage of the vehicle and match it to the suggested brand. If we have a question, which oftentimes we do, we will research those vehicles through law enforcement databases to ensure that it receives proper branding. The patrol has serious concerns that vehicles inspected by salvage pools could be easily marked as salvage instead of non-repairable, for example. Uh, salvage pools have monetary interest in each vehicle and a salvage brand carries a higher resale value than a non-repairable vehicle. Having the patrol inspect these vehicles is of the utmost importance to maintain the legit legitimacy and integrity of the VIN program, while at the same time protecting the public from consumer fraud. This bill also makes mention that the patrol allows new vehicle dealers to inspect the vehicles they purchase. Um, that's, that broad statement would lead anyone to believe that dealers can inspect any of the cars that they buy, and so should the salvage pools. Uh, however, this broad statement is extremely misleading. In fact, uh, for a new vehicle dealer, for a dealership to be able to qualify to do their own VIN inspections, they would first must be a new vehicle dealer. And two, and the most important part of this, is that they can only inspect cars that we refer to as program vehicles. And program vehicles are typically those cars that are um, never titled to an individual. They are only owned straight from the manufacturer to a corporation or uh, rental services. And those vehicles, once the use of those vehicles and that entity, they are purchased by the dealerships, coming to the dealerships having never been titled or owned privately. Those vehicles can only receive a regular certificate of title or a clean title and those are the vehicles that the new dealers can inspect. Now, currently, um, our unit has more than enough personnel to inspect any requested VIN inspections at salvage pools. And like I said before, we on average do 10 to 18 inspections per week at the salvage pools, and we have no problem meeting that. However, if we were to take on a program that allows salvage pools to do their own VIN inspections, we're talking about adding a fairly significant financial burden to the agency. I'm talking about um, new forms, manuals, training courses, and additional personnel to provide some type of audit or oversight uh, program. 
And a couple times I heard mentioned uh, some other states that allow VIN inspections by some salvage pools. The two that we're aware of, New Mexico and Colorado, we have spoken with them. And while, yes, they do allow salvage pools to perform those inspections, I have to say that their VIN programs, their inspection programs are not what the Kansas Highway Patrols are. As I mentioned before, that uh, ours is very thorough and at the risk of sounding, um, well, I, I just should say theirs, theirs are not as thorough as the, as the state of Kansas VIN inspection programs are. <clears throat> so in closing, uh, we oppose Senate Bill 36 um, because of the risk it presents to the VIN program that we are statutor statutorily required to maintain and the risk of fraud for future buyers and consumers. And we sincerely thank the committee members for their consideration and our testimony. And I will stand for questions now. Thank you. Other questions? Representative Francis. So just so that I understand your position, you really don't have an issue with the, uh, what we're calling section two here, which allows them to uh, process the abandoned vehicles. Your primary concern is with the VIN inspection by the salvage yard and that you say there is no backlog on your inspection. You guys are staying up as quick as they want you, basically. So the, the abandoned part doesn't fall under the highway patrol's purview. The VIN inspections do. And all we know is what they tell us. So if they call in and say they have 20 cars to be inspected, we'll go and inspect 20 cars. So unless there's not something that they're not telling us and they've got 100 cars that are needing VIN inspections, if they don't tell us, we don't know. So yes, as far as I'm concerned, as long as we meet that, that request on our boards in Kansas City and Wichita, I consider ourselves caught up. Representative Seibert. Thank you. Thank you for your work. Uh, it's kind of interesting. The guy that stole my car stole three that weekend. <laughs> they found them all. Um, when you go to one of those sites, how, uh, and you say you inspect 20 to 100 cars, how many of them do you find are, are not accounted for or stolen or whatever you want to call them? Because the guy that stole mine was attributed to 75 car thefts. So if we go to a salvage pool and do inspections, um, so unfortunately, I'm not one of the boots on the ground. Uh, we've got much more, um, you know, much harder <laughs> workers than I. Uh, but I do know of instances, and I can't give you the exact numbers, but where we have gone into salvage pools and then pulled out stolen vehicles. I just can't give you an exact number. I apologize for that. But with a little bit of research, I'm sure I could figure out some numbers for you. Well, my question is, again, to, to my instance, where he stole the three in one week, and they all three on, ended up in the lot. So would the, the police know that they were there because they had them towed? They wouldn't know until they, uh, let's say, so you're saying if they went into a tow lot. Yeah. Okay. Uh, for In order for that tow company to claim ownership of those vehicles, they would have to file a possessory lien affidavit. Okay. And those possessory lien affidavits require the Kansas Highway Patrol to do a VIN inspection on them. And when we come in and do the VIN inspection, we would re realize that either A, the possessory lien was fraudulent, or B, the VIN numbers were in NCIC. And yes, we would recover the vehicles and then get them back to their rightful owner. Okay. Thank you, sir. Representative Proctor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you, Captain, for your service. Um, I, from your perspective, how did we arrive at the situation where we've got these hundreds of vehicles on these lots, thousands of vehicles on these lots, um, if you guys are so available? I'm just trying to wrap my head around where the disconnect is. I mean, are they stockpiling them in hopes of this bill, or what, what do you think? So a VIN inspection can only be completed when a vehicle has the appropriate accompanying ownership documents. So what, from what I understand, when these vehicles come in and are essentially abandoned by the previous owner and the insurance company, they don't have any documents with them. So until a vehicle has ownership documents, it cannot have a VIN inspection, a proper VIN inspection completed. 
So I think that's where you're seeing the high degree of abandoned vehicles is because all parties have lost interest in it and have no desire to do the back the backlog of, of work in order to reach, you know, to find those ownership documents. However, it's my understanding that the Kansas Department of Revenue uh, has a process for that, except that follows under their purview. Mr. Chairman, if I could just. Absolutely. Uh, so I, I, I apologize for making you comment on hypothetical legislation here, but if we could do something to change the statute so in these specific cases you could inspect without those documents would you be would uh, the, the highway patrol be opposed to that or would you be okay with that would that be an okay compromise the it would it would take some serious thought because for one the the document portion is is essentially the the certificate of livelihood for this vehicle okay so if if we can't take a, an ownership document and match a VIN number to the physical car itself, then who's to say where this car ever came, came from or who owned it before? So they go hand in hand. Um, now, if there's, a, if there's a process where a car is abandoned and the state of Kansas deems it proper to issue a uh, salvage title for it and they ask us to come in and do an inspection off the title that they have issued it, we have no problem doing that, obviously. Further questions? Representative Weigel. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, how many Subaru uh, case three personnel do you have assigned to do the CIN inspection? Uh, currently, there are 13 uniforms and roughly 58 to 60, depending on how our manpower issues are, civilians that go out and do our VIN inspections for us. And do you have fixed sites where people bring their cars to you uh, that need to be titled here that, that have come from another state or from some other jurisdiction? Yes, we've got uh, three static locations in the Kansas City area. We've got one in Lawrence, one in Topeka, two in Wichita, and a couple others scattered throughout the state that are open one or two days a week. And one last question. If, if it's not a dealer, if it's a, uh, if, it, if it's a guy that buys a vehicle uh, that may or may not be wrecked from another state, they go to the auto auctions in some other state, and it's a muscle car type vehicle, and they bring it here, what, what do they have to bring to you in order for that vehicle to be checked for VIN so that it can be registered within the state? And do you, does the KHP charge that individual to do that? And you're talking about a vehicle that's bought from out of state or one from, that's... From, say, Iowa. And okay. And bring it back here. And it's a, it's a 69... Camaro, but it's been sitting in a barn for 30 years. So what we would need is just simply a driver's license of the driver of the vehicle or the one that's bringing it in, and we would need the ownership documents, such as a title. If it's an antique vehicle, those can be sold on a bill of sale, but only for Kansas to Kansas residents. So if it was from out of state, we would definitely need a title to make sure the VIN inspection is complete. And what do you charge that individual to bring it to So every inspection we do is a $20 fee, uh, with the exception of rebuilt salvage, which are 25 Thank you. Thank you for your information. Thank you, Mr. Thank Chairman. You. Further th further questions? Seeing none, thank you very much, Captain. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Is that? Fixing that Camaro. <laughs> I bring the committee's attention to written testimony from Ed Klump with the Kansas Association of Chiefs of Police, Sheriff's Association, and Peace Officer Association. Does anyone else wish to speak as an opponent? I have no one listed as neutral. Does anyone wish to speak as a neutral? 
Seeing none, we'll close the hearing on Senate Bill 36. Betty, I'd bring your attention to doing some final action. Um, Advisor Wagner, did uh, do you have a preference of which number we use on the designation of uh, bridges and, and highway? Which which one we use? Uh, Mr. Chairman, if the committee is amenable to it, I, I would prefer House Bill twenty two forty seven. Um, but the yeah, if the intention is to bundle, that would probably be the best one to bundle. Okay, into. that that was my question, and and. Uh, so, committee, my uh, what I would uh, recommend is that we 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 take a look at each individual one separately, and then we'll then we'll bundle. So, revisor, do you uh, have anything uh, you would like to add to this on House Bill twenty two forty seven? We'll start with that one. Uh, no, Chairman, it's just uh, if you want me to brief it, I'll go Please. ahead and do that. Designates a portion of K seventy there's K sixty seven in Norton County as the CO one Trenton J Brinkman Memorial Highway. Uh, it's beginning from the southern limits of Norton Correctional Facility, then the northern limits of Norton Correctional Facility, and uh, uh, no signs will be placed until uh, all uh, the Department of Transportation receives sufficient funds to cover the cost of the signs, plus an additional fifty percent uh, on those. Or on the costs. Okay. Representative Hoheisel, did you have a, do you want to make a motion? Yeah, I'll make the motion. I do have an amendment onto this, but I'll make the motion to pass out 2247 favorably. Is there a second? Second by Representative uh, Francis. And you have, an, uh, you have an amendment. Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, for those who were on the committee last year, we heard a bill, HB 2431, and it's a bridge naming bill for, uh, his name was Tyler Juden. Um, he was killed in action in Afghanistan, September 12, 2009. Um, the family came, it was a very emotional uh, hearing. And uh, Tyler was born in Winfield and he graduated from Mark City. Uh, in 2004, we passed this bill out, obviously, with COVID. It, uh, it didn't gain any. I think we passed it out of the whole House, and then it went to the Senate. Um, what my amendment does, there was, a, there was a bill out this year for it as well. What my amendment does is take that bill and insert it into this bill as well. So with that, I'll stand for questions, Mr. Chair. Is there a second? Second by Representative Ballard. Is there a discussion? Representative Seiwert. When you say you're going to take this, insert that into that bill, is this like a gut and go or is this? No, so, no the contents of the original the bill. bill are still in there. We're just inserting this into that bill as well. In addition to it. Yes, sir. Because when you say to inter into that, it makes it sound like it's a gut and go. Oh, no, 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 sir. Okay. Representative Ballard. I second it because I remembered that bill. But why do we need to insert the new bill into it? I mean, it's not updating it, uh, but tell me why you want to. So this bill, um, we didn't hear it this year. So we don't have it scheduled to work on final action. And if we don't pass it out by the end of this week, this will, bill will go, um, it'll die till next year. I don't want this family to have to wait another year for this honor. I so agree. I would like to get this done now. I agree, thank you. Further discussion on the amendment? Hearing none, Representative, you may close. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, body. I just, I again, as I said, I don't want to wait any longer on this. This family deserves this honor. This fallen soldier deserves this honor. So I'd like to get this done now, and with that, I'll close. You've heard the motion to amend. All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, no. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it. We're back on uh, on the bill. Um, Advisor, do we go ahead and pass this bill or do we move on to the next one? Okay. Representative Delper Dang. Thank you, Chairman. Um, 
specific to 2247. When this thing, when this bill came to us, <clears throat> and we heard it, what a week ago, I want to say, um, there was some question about the title that was on here for the individual Brenton, Brenton Brinkman on Memorial Highway. At first, we questioned the COI, but it, I verified it is actually CO1. But I've since reached out with Randy Bowman with the Department of Corrections, and I've had a lot of back and forth conversations. And if I, if you would allow me to, I'd like to read just a little paragraph yeah. on that. Okay, just this is a correspondence going on between myself and Randy Bowman. Um, he's just saying, I hope you can help on the 2247. I learned at the end of this morning that whomever asked for this bill was not current on the employee Brent, Trent Brinkman's job classification. And at the time of his passing, he was actually a CO2, not a CO1, as the bill was written for. And he went on to say that he had talked to HR to verify it and was asking for help to correct this. So with that said, uh, Mr. Chairman, I do have an amendment on here. And moved by Representative Delperdang, second by Representative Helgerson. While, it, while you're getting the amendment out here, it really is just a technical amendment. Uh, we went ahead and changed the title on the individual from a CO1 to a CO2. Nothing else in this bill has changed. So with that, if anyone has questions, I'd be happy to answer. Are there any questions for the maker of the motion? Seeing none, Representative, you may close. I would appreciate your consideration on it. And if you, anybody in here would like to see any of the correspondence between me and uh, Randy Bowman with the Department of Corrections, you're more than welcome. So with that, I close. We've heard the motion to amend. All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, no. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it. Now, Reviser, do I do we go ahead and uh, move this bill, or do we go on to the others? Mr. Chairman, you can probably just go on to the others, um, and then I, no additional motions would be required. The motion could then just be to insert the contents of twenty one thirty two and twenty nineteen into twenty two forty seven. If that okay. is the committee's intention. would you uh, would you brief us real quickly on twenty one thirty two and twenty twenty nineteen? Yes, sir. Uh, House Bill 2019 designates bridges on U.S. Highway 54 as the Jack Taylor Memorial Bridge and the Max Zimmerman Memorial Bridge. Uh, as I said, these would be on U.S. Highway 54 in Seward County. Um, and then House Bill 2132 would designate a bridge on U.S. Highway 77 in Riley County as the PFC Loren H. Larson Memorial Bridge. Both uh, bridge signs will not be placed until the uh, Secretary of Transportation receives sufficient funds plus 50% to cover costs and maintenance. <clears throat> I'd be happy to answer your questions. Are there any questions? Seeing none, thank you. Representative Helgerson. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd make a motion that we add in uh, House Bill 2132. There's a motion. Is there a second by Representative Ho Heisel? Is there a discussion? See none. You may uh, close. close. You've heard the motion to uh, add 2132 into. Uh, uh, is it added to it? Yes. Add it to uh, 2247. All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Motion carries. Representative Helgerson. Mr. Chairman, I move that we add in House Bill 2019 into uh, the 2247. Second by Representative Hoheisel. Is there discussion? Are there questions? Seeing none, you may close. I close. Heard the motion by uh, Representative Helgerson to add the contents of uh, House Bill 2019 uh, into House Bill 2247. All in favor signify by saying aye. Opposed, no. Motion carries. We're back on uh, House Bill 2247. Representative Helgerson. Um, 
seeing no other per are we still on the motion or can i make a motion to pass it out favorably as amended uh, i assume we have to do a substitute bill is that correct uh this one would probably be easier to do without if that's okay without it that's fine then i move that we pass out uh house bill 2247 uh, as amended seconded by representative ho heisel are there questions is there, are there comments Seeing none, Representative, you may close. Close. Heard the motion by Representative uh, Helgerson to pass out House Bill 2247 as amended. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, no. Motion carries. Committee, we had one other bill we were going to work. Uh, time is short. We'll uh, probably uh, go ahead and work it tomorrow, and that was uh, House Bill 2295. Uh, with no further business to come before the committee, we are adjourned.